If there's one thing the Half-Life series is known for, it's raising the bar. Valve has always been one of the most innovative, ambitious companies developing games. Nearly all of their games were massively advanced for the time, and hosting some of the tightest design the medium has ever known. They may seem quaint with today's technology, but the shifting walls in Portal 2 changing the world on the fly was incredibly impressive at the time. These other games, Left 4 Dead, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Team Fortress 2, these were all trendsetters, taking the technology available and using it in extremely clever and compelling ways. Half-Life, on the other hand, has always been about setting a new standard, not a trend, and making older games feel quaint. Half-Life 2's gravity gun and its tight focus on world building completely colored the next decade of first-person games. I can't even count the number of games that take massive inspiration from Half-Life 2, and the exact same can be said for Half-Life 1. Games like Doom 3, Deus Ex, Far Cry, Halo, No One Lives Forever, they all, to some degree, owe their approach to storytelling to Half-Life, the game that showed us all that first-person games can be full of action and have a kick-ass story running parallel to that action. Well, as I'm sure you can imply from this opening paragraph, Half-Life Alex continues that tradition of setting a new standard for games, only this time it's VR gaming that it's set the standard for. Half-Life Alex is a bold statement from Valve, and that statement is, we know what works and what doesn't work in VR. We're so confident in our understanding of the medium that we're going to develop some VR game mechanics and create a 15 hour campaign with ridiculous levels of production value and unparalleled levels of polish. Releasing a Half-Life game in 2020 has to be one of the most daunting tasks in the world. The level of expectation for the series is utterly insane, and to have so much confidence in your abilities in the wild frontier of game design that is VR is equally insane. But Valve, again, knew what worked and what didn't in VR. While games like Boneworks, Arizona Sunshine, The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners, and Doom VFR were all experimenting with different ways for the player to interact with VR, Valve was just sitting in the shadows taking notes, releasing occasional experiments in the form of demos like The Lab and Aperture Hand Labs. I could spend hours talking about the strengths and weaknesses of various VR experiments like Boneworks and Contagion VR Outbreak, but rather than do that, let's focus on the lessons Valve took away from all those years of experimental developments, and how Valve set the standard for, at the very least, the next five years of VR game mechanics. Firstly, the more mechanics you can dedicate to a unique motion, rather than a button press, the better. In the early days of Roomscale VR, weapons that you had to manually reload were limited to target range games like Gun Club VR. In most games that aspire to an actual story and a gameplay challenge, weapons were just reloaded by hitting a button, and healing was done by picking up medkits or automatic health regen. Even crouching tended to be assigned to a button rather than a motion in a ton of early Roomscale games. Well, as it turns out, manual reloading is fun, manual crouching is fun, and manual healing is fun. This is all simply because it begs the player to get creative with their actions. You might hold up a pistol with one hand and wrap a bandage around that arm with the other hand. You could push yourself to the absolute limit of your crouching ability to stay below a pathetic piece of cover. You could keep a clip ready in one hand so that you can quickly reload as soon as your current weapon runs out of ammo. Interactions like these are just plain fun. More fun than pressing the crouch button, the heal button, or the reload button. Giving the player more responsibility over their current state also has another benefit. It makes combat less boring. Taking cover is a vital part of fighting armed enemies in Half-Life, and indeed in almost every first-person shooter. Well, as it turns out, waiting for the enemy to stop firing is kind of boring when it's just a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two fight, and you're all just taking turns being the mole and whack-a-mole. So what can a game do to make this interaction more fun? Simple. Give the player something to do while they wait for the enemy to stop with their suppressing fire. Reloading weapons, using the gravity gun or gravity gloves to pull supplies to them from across the line of fire, quickly healing yourself while you have a chance, or throwing a grenade out of cover just before you peek again to disorient the enemy and break their suppression. Next up, we'll cover the main thing that VR's more intuitive controls do best, interacting with the world. VR games past have taken several different approaches to the design problems that this area presents. Should your hands pass through things so that you're more grounded and feeling less out of your own body? Should doors open from a simple shove? Should you be able to pull objects from a distance rather than bending over to pick them up? What about mantling ledges, throwing grenades or other objects, or sticking your hand through a window? So many different VR games have tried so many different solutions to these problems, and again, Half-Life Alex has taken the data from all of those experiments and figured out the best, most intuitive solutions and polished them to near perfection. Let's take a close look at these to showcase just how much thought goes into designing VR mechanics for the simplest real-world interactions. First off, we've got hands passing through things. 
There's one major benefit to this, that being the increased awareness of where you are in reality, and the fact that your proprioception, that is, your ability to know without looking, where your extremities are in relation to the rest of your body, is perfectly synced with your vision. Where you feel like your hands are is exactly where it looks like your hands are. However, the drawbacks to this are much more severe. If left unchecked, the player can stick their hand through a wall and interact with a switch on the other side of it. It takes much more thought from the player to rest their hand on a virtual surface, and one major drawback is that grabbing and throwing objects is much less intuitive. In a lot of VR games where your hands pass through objects, in order to throw something, you just need to release the grip button as soon as you want to let go of the object. However, in actual throwing, as in Half-Life Alex, throwing an object means that you're pushing the object with your hand even after you've let go of it. The same can also be said for catching an object. You cradle it with your hand well before you actually grip it with your fingers. Then you've got less essential movements like using your hand to push an object off of a shelf. All of these are made much more intuitive, and in some cases made possible, by the fact that Alex's hands cannot pass through objects or surfaces in the game. For another example of interacting with the world, one that's so critical that it honestly should have its own section, we'll look at the gravity gloves. In a ton of VR games, the player is able to force pull objects into their hand by reaching out to them and grabbing. Sure, bending over to pick up objects is more realistic, but this is where the realism of VR generally needs to concede. My feet hurt like hell after playing Half-Life Alex all day. If I had to bend over to pick up every random object I grabbed off the floor, I'd be bedridden as I write this. So neither solution seems that good yet. We don't want sore knees, but we also don't want to stop the player from interacting with objects the realistic way. If picking up an object on the other side of the room requires the exact same input as picking up an object that's an arm's reach, why would the player bother getting immersed and walking over there? Well, Alex, once again, has a better solution, and this comes from implementing a force-grabbing system as seen in many games, and then polishing and refining it to much higher levels. In a game like Saints and Sinners, you just grab at the object and it flies in a straight line towards your hand. Once you grab the object, it may as well be in your hand. The flight towards you is just for visual flair and readability. In Alex, it's a bit more complicated. There's a simple gesture that you do to fling objects towards you, and then you grab it. Now, there is a whole lot of cheating going on here on the game's part, but all of that is critical to how natural this feels. If an object is falling and you want to catch it, you just have to catch it with your hand, same as picking up any other object. But if you use the gravity gloves to pull an object towards you, all sorts of interesting properties are applied to it until it hits the ground again. So let's look at this in the order that it takes place. Say I want to use the gravity gloves to take this bottle from the other side of this training area. First, I make a fist with my hand and point my palm towards the object. Then I do a simple flick of the wrist and it launches towards that hand. Forgive the frame rate as I put this in slow motion. If I move my hand while this object is in mid-flight, it will automatically course correct until it goes past me or until I try to catch it. This bottle is headed directly for my hand, no matter what. What if I move my hand at the last second or quickly move backwards while it's flying towards me and it can't course correct in time? Well, while an object is being influenced by the gravity gloves, the game knows that I want to catch it, so it cheats a lot and allows me to grab it without putting my hand on it first. It flies in a straight line towards my hand as soon as I grab. Essentially, the gravity gloves use physics to bring the object towards me, and as soon as it's about a foot or two away, grabbing acts as it does in many other VR games, the direct beeline to my hand. As soon as I make the grabbing motion, it may as well be in my hand, as in Saints and Sinners or many other games, but I have to use the gravity gloves to pull it over first. This all sounds massively complicated, but the very first time I used the gravity gloves, I got a perfect catch. Immediately after, I tried it with my left hand, which I'm useless with in the real world, and I got another perfect catch. After 30 minutes, I could catch an object with my left hand even if the room was completely dark and I couldn't see my hands or the object I wanted to grab. I pulled this off every single time without fail. The only times I ever messed up with the gravity gloves is when the game very deliberately puts a barnacle in front of an object I wanted to grab, and the barnacle's tongue would snatch it out of the air, or when the game had objects in tight spaces, requiring that I either get up close and grab it the traditional way, or had to get creative with the angle I was using the gloves at. This solves that other problem with force grabbing that I mentioned. I had cause to get up close to the objects I was grabbing, and I had to think more about the environment I was in with every force grab. The gravity glove system is quite literally the perfect solution to the problem of picking up objects in an intuitive way. And since it's Half-Life, they even get to explain why you're able to force grab objects, whereas it just seems like a weird game design accommodation in something like the Saints and Sinners. Even in the end of the game, I was still using the gravity gloves on random objects with pure glee, even though I had no intention of actually using those objects for anything. As soon as you get your hands on these things, you'll see what I mean. It's the most natural movement in the world. 
Again, Half-Life Alex looked at what these VR games have succeeded and failed at, it decided on the solution that it thinks is best, and then it polished it to a mere sheen. I think I'm starting to get my point across about how Alex has, like Half-Life and Half-Life 2 before, written the new rules of game design that other developers will follow like the word of God for the next few years. But before I close this up and get to work on the real Half-Life Alex analysis, let me take a moment to praise these weapons. Valve would like for everyone to be sold on VR, whether they're using Valve's own headset, the Index, or one of the other headsets made by other companies. As a result, Alex is designed with every headset's drawbacks accommodated for. I've covered this in a previous video, but for a brief catch-up, Steam VR headsets use these IR sensors to detect where your head and hands are, which is the most accurate form of tracking, but it also takes up the most space and costs more money. A more recent alternative is what's called inside-out tracking, where cameras inside the headset track where it is in the world and where the controllers are. Inside-out tracking is great for the obvious reasons of compactness and portability, but it struggles with two things. Putting the controllers in front of each other, and putting the controllers behind your back, or other parts of your body. Well, there's one motion that absolutely demands that I put one controller in front of the other, and it's incredibly damaging. Aiming down the sights of a two-handed weapon. As someone with the Vive Cosmos, which suffers particularly bad with these issues, I just didn't even bother using rifles in games like Boneworks or Saints and Sinners unless they had a laser sight. Trying to aim down the sights of my weapon would just result in the weapon violently shaking from side to side, making long range combat a huge pain. This is the main reason that all of the weapons in Half-Life Alex are one-handed. You can brace the gun with your second hand by resting your controller on your other palm, perfectly mimicking the stance we see on screen, but even that is more of an immersion thing than something with major benefits. This pose doesn't bother my headset's inside-out tracking whatsoever, and as a result, I could get the absolute most out of each weapon. Over my entire playthrough, I didn't think about the drawbacks of inside-out tracking a single time. They just never came up. It would have ruined a whole lot of combat encounters for me if I had to use a two-handed weapon at any point in the game. While I know a lot of games can't afford this accommodation because they want to focus on realistic weapons and less Half-Life-esque aesthetics, I desperately hope that this idea Valve had will serve as major food for thought for other VR developers going forward. I could go on to talk about enemy designs with tiny weak points that aren't too difficult to hit with how easy close range aiming is in VR, or the AI feature that leads to enemies not running away as quickly as would be realistic from the difficult to accurately throw grenades, or only breaching your cover one at a time, or how the game is littered with barnacles to compensate for your increased spatial awareness, or so many other genius game design choices. But I think that how the next few years of VR games take inspiration from Alex will prove my points perfectly. Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 showed everybody what was possible when you thought outside of the box, and as a result, the innovations in those games went on to color so many years of gaming ahead of them. Well, at least in the world of VR, Half-Life Alex has done the same. Over its development and design, it tried everything, and only the things that truly work excellently in VR made the cut, and if something had that potential but felt janky in other games, Alex polished and refined it until it worked seamlessly and beautifully. Half-Life Alex wrote the rules for VR to live by over these next few years. Once again, Half-Life raised the bar.